Okay, hello everyone. Today we have Dr. Dong Woo Kang. Um, he's recently graduated from the University of Alberta, um, and he he's currently working as a or he's starting to work as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Medical Oncology at Harvard University. So we really appreciate Dr. Kang coming in and talking for us about randomized controlled trial. And I'm really excited to have some conversation about it. Hello, Dr. Kang. Hi, uh, Dr. Young. Uh, <laughs> Lee, sorry, Dr. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Young. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, having me yeah. here. Yeah, no. thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. So so you just moved to Boston. How's Boston? Uh, Boston is so beautiful. Very, very beautiful city. Very historic city. I haven't been really exploring this place yet, but um, mm -hmm. I just got here two days ago. Still yeah. like a lot of jet lag and <laughs> adjusting <laughs> myself, but I, yeah, a lot to discover. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully when the COVID is over, hopefully um, you'll be able to enjoy the city a little bit more. And congratulations on your new position. Thank you. Um, so that's, yeah, very exciting. Um, so today we're going, we are going to be talking about randomized controlled trials. It's one of the study designs that are that is often used in epidemiology. Um, and I know that you've done some research using randomized controlled trials. So I I'm really excited to talk about it. So before we really begin, do you want to give our students a sense of who you are in any way that you like? Sure. Uh, so it's just Dr. Lee said, I'm a postdoc. I just uh, graduated from the University of Alberta in kinesiology um, major. And my background is largely in exercise physiology. So I graduated um, Yonsei University in Korea from uh, the Department of um, Sports and Leisure Studies and the, um, in, the, in the master's degree the sa in the same university. So I have um, graduated from, from the kinesiology um, background. And, um, and I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the intro. Um, so, so, can you tell us now a little bit about what you do for your research? Like, what is your disciplinary uh, training? What is your expertise, and what are your research interests? Sure. So, mostly, uh, I have. So there is some kind of research questions that are asking, um, for example, how exercise can benefit people, people with disease, especially cancer patients, for particularly for my uh, research area. So we are really focusing on in many aspects, but um, how exercise is physiolo physiologically changes our body that can help with cancer uh, patients patients uh, progression of their disease mm -hmm. or also we are focusing on their psychological aspect uh, how exercise can help with so for example depression in cancer patients or anxiety mm -hmm. uh, as well as in some um, other like physical activity behavior itself so in the long mm -hmm. term uh, behavior changes so there are like large uh, like, um, body of um, research that has had been done in this kind of research area, which is called exercise oncology. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's yeah, perfect. yeah. Thanks for the description. So it sounds like your work is at the nexus of you know physiology for kin students, exercise physiology, um, mm -hmm. oncology, exercise oncology, and epidemiology because you are using epidemiological methods in your research. Um, mm -hmm. But is there any reason why you chose uh, cancer out of you know different chronic diseases that are getting more and more prevalent? <laughs> Absolutely, I think it's more um, more personal to me because I have some uh, a family um, history that who who had has died died of cancer, 
And mm. my dad also was um, a cancer survival. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer and also mm. lung cancer. And he had mm -hmm. to go through very difficult treatment. And, um, and as an exercise physiologist and or a researcher, I got to ask oh, how exercise can help with uh, health cancer patients with their um, mm -hmm. uh, treatments or um, the mental health that are, that are really, really, um, really difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there have not been a lot of research until let's, let's say 10 to 15 years ago. And then this exercise oncology research has been um, established a lot over the last 10 to 15 years. So mm -hmm. it's relatively new field of research. And also there's lots of demands um, from like patients and mm -hmm. patient um, supporters and caregivers too. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is a really important area in, in especially kinesiology and medical. So there are lots of interest in many fields mm -hmm. um, surrounding cancer patients and exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it sounds like you have a strong personal motivation, but also um, there's a big gap in, in research mm -hmm. where, where this particular uh, research sub research area is really important for you know future cancer patient care. Exactly. Yeah. I can give you a really quick example how important I think it is. So sure. maybe yeah, maybe 15 years ago you can mm -hmm. think about um, cardiac patients. Mm -hmm. And at the time, if you're uh, having cardiac surgery, mm -hmm. and what you need to do is just, you have to uh, lying on a bed for six to eight weeks doing nothing, that's the first line of treatment or mm -hmm. not treatment, it's the first line of plan for them. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, if you, as you might know, if you had a cardiac surgery, exercise is the first thing you do the next the next day you, you're you done your treatment or, or the surgery. So really, like right next day? Right next day, you have mm -hmm. to start kind of by walking mm -hmm. or you have to rehabilitate yourself right mm -hmm. after the surgery. Mm -hmm. so that's how um, this kind of exercise research has done over the years and then it has been implemented in the medical field. Mm -hmm. So it actually, yeah, I think it can be applied to cancer setting too. Mm -hmm. but For now, sure. Yeah, but now we don't have any uh, kind of formal or medical care for cancer patients. Um, yeah, right now. Right. Yeah. So, so basically at Harvard, what you're gonna continue to work on is to implement exercise um, component into cancer patient care. Exactly, that's our uh, kind of end goal. Nice. Research, yes. Yeah, nice, that's good. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the next question. So can you, the, it's, this is the main topic of this interview. Can you tell us about what randomized control control the trial is um, and how you utilize that method in your research. Absolutely. So I think randomized control trial, uh, RCT for short, uh, is a type of ex experimental studies that are uh, testing the effectiveness of inter uh, intervention or interventions to uh, control group. So Randomized control trial is um, is a very kind of um, essential part of a treatment to be implemented to patients. Mm -hmm. uh, randomized control trial is to reduce any type of bias that can be um, found or uh, in different types of researches, and then we use those um, previous evidence that we use and we you, we do this randomized control trial to kind of confirm the effect of the intervention. Mm -hmm. So so uh, yes. so you mentioned about the bias and RCT is to minimize potential biases that could happen that could occur in research. Um, so can you tell tell us a little bit more about that? What kind of biases are you talking about? And how do you control those biases or minimize those biases using what kind of protocols? 
per se, for example. Sure. So normally when you are, when you want to test, for example, um, I think it's a, it's a good example if you can use this COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's been, <laughs> I think you've been hearing about this. In the mm -hmm. news a lot. So, For sure. Yes. So you, we want to test this vaccine if mm -hmm. it's effective or not. And randomized control trial can recruit a group of patients. And then we select any of these people. So for example, one person was recruited, recruited, and we randomize this person either like um, this vaccine or a placebo. Mm -hmm. So these patients can be anyone and we don't um, separate them based on their baseline characteristics. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you test about, uh, um, when you sometimes uh, try to find this kind of effect from this large group of people mm -hmm. from the epidemiological studies, um, and then if you select people from using your research question or there might be selection bias, but in randomized control trial, for example, selection bias is minimized by randomizing these people, either group A or this vaccine or the other placebo group. Mm -hmm. so at the end of the study, is uh, any bias, for example, for selecting people mm -hmm. is all balanced out because it's all randomized. Right. Throughout the study. Mm -hmm. So people are uh, randomized into either intervention in this example, um, getting vaccinated or to control. So those who are receiving placebo. Yes. Um, and do the participants would know which group they are in? So yeah, they wouldn't, yes, that's a good question. So yeah, they would not know if they are, um, which group they are in. So mm -hmm. that's another really good component about the randomized control trial. So which is called blinding. So right. uh, yeah, um, the single, there's a single blinding, double blinding or triple blinding. There are different terminologies, but I don't know mm -hmm. if to but uh simply sure go ahead yeah simply put so single blinding is uh so the patients who are getting this treatment are mm -hmm. blinded to the intervention or the treatment so mm -hmm. patients do not know what they are getting so that's right. very very essential blinding component mm -hmm. but if a randomized control trial is more um is more uh, robust in terms of to see the effectiveness, mm -hmm. investigator who are um, uh, or implying imp implementing this uh, study, let's for example nurses, or do, do they are also blinded to the um, uh, to the treatment groups. So that's think double blind, uh, double blind setting, and then triple blind is also adding on a uh, research investigator. Mm. are kind of um, designing this study mm -hmm. like, and they are also blinded and we call it triple blinding mm -hmm. so triple blinding is the most robust uh, blinding protocol exactly yeah exactly so there so we can see there are, might be a type of bias when if you know uh, this person is this group and that person is that group and then as an investigator, you might have a bias to, mm -hmm. um, for example, like analyzing data or reporting these outcomes. So this is really important component and then make this result more robust um, in, in many aspects. Right. So I, I just want to um, talk a little bit deeper about this. So res researchers can have a bias in terms of um, analyzing and interpreting the data when they know which people are assigned to intervention or control. Um, right. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Can you explain a little bit more? Sure, detail? I can just give you a very simple example mm -hmm. that can happen, especially in exercise trials. Mm -hmm. So, Unlike drug trials, exercise trial cannot uh, 
can think of it, exercise trial cannot uh, make patients or in interventionists to be blinded to the group. For example, mm -hmm. you are getting exercise, right? Blinded that you are not <laughs> you're doing exercise or not. You know right. you're doing exercise, right? And then also, if you are exercise physiologists who are providing exercise programs, and you know this mm -hmm. person is in exercise group, right? And you you would know their names, and you would get to know them personally. So it's exactly. in, so in exercise um, RCTs, it's impossible to have um, triple blinding or or double blinding because exactly. of the nature of the study design and. Yeah, the exactly. program. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, so what I was going to say was, so if you are not blinded to the group, for example, patients, for example, patient, I'm a patient who are uh, in the exercise group. And then this patient is maybe, um, for example, filling out this questionnaire that this intervention was helpful for their anxiety. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that they know they're doing exercise and you, they know exercise might be beneficial mm. and they know they are in the exercise group. Mm -hmm. so regardless of the actual effect of exercise, they might report that they are better. Right. Um, so that's right. a type of bias that can, that can happen. Mm -hmm. And also so interventionists, they know or in many um, settings, exercise interventionists can also measure their baseline and post-intervention outcomes. And they might think, or there's might be a bias that exercise pay, uh, group should have a better outcomes. And that's, mm -hmm. so we have to uh, kind of blind this uh, or, or have to minimize this kind mm -hmm. of potential bias. Right. In Right. So then let's talk about the RAISE trial. So um, I believe that you wrote your doctoral thesis based on this trial. So you were the, the leading person of this ERASE trial. So can you tell us a, a, about what this is, what the trial trial, trial is? <laughs> Absolutely. I, um, I actually just had my uh, doctoral defense <laughs> like a month ago. So I hope I can remember <laughs> everything. <laughs> uh, so ERASE trial is kind of acronym of my study. It's called e act, uh, e Effect of Exercise, uh, Effect of Exercise During Active Surveillance in Prostate Cancer Patients. Mm -hmm. You didn't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Little title. Let's see. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. So... Uh, as you know, I am having those kind of questions, how exercise can help with uh, so cancer. And we, uh, I got to know that there are a group of patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer specifically, and they are not getting any treatment. But at first I thought that doesn't make sense. They have cancer and then they have to be treated right away. Mm -hmm. But but there has been some concerns that pe patients are over-diagnosed, hmm. whereby there are over-treatments, over which means they don't really need to be treated and they have some side effects from treatment mm -hmm. while they didn't really need to and they didn't really need to go through this side effect of this mm -hmm. difficult treatment. Mm -hmm. so I think it's really kind of new concept in a cancer um, cancer settings and people are, so there are some cancer patients who are not getting treatments mm -hmm. and it's called in specifically in, in prostate cancer, uh, we call it active surveillance mm -hmm. term that we use in, in the medical urology or uro-oncology. Mm -hmm. Active surveillance is a uh, practical, um, a clinical practice that uh, Patients are not getting any treatment, but they're really actively monitored. If the tumor they found from either biopsy or blood work, they're just closely monitored and see if it's progressing or not. Mm -hmm. And if there's a sign, they can be treated unless mm -hmm. they can just live with the cancer. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't harm anything. Like they're just fine. They're just right. fine with cancer. 
Mm-hmm. So my question was, oh, although the, the, maybe the risk is low, that's why they are just monitored, mm-hmm. but exercise also can do something. For example, exercise, I know that as an exercise physiology background, exercise increases immunity and also it increases cancer surveillance, which mm-hmm. is um, kind of physiological uh, mechanism that can find cancer tumors throughout the body and fight with the cancer. Mm-hmm. And also there are a lot of mechanisms that can, that can address these issues. Mm-hmm. So I um, had this question and then try, wanted to test that exercise can help first this patient has uh, cancer and then it can reduce or delay any progression of their cancer progression. Mm-hmm. So uh, another really important part of this ERASE study was these patients have higher anxiety and uh, fear of cancer progression. And you can imagine if you live with cancer and then it's not treated and you have, you, you might probably have an anxiety. Mm-hmm. There's a chance that it can, it can grow. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a um, trade-off that the, you're not getting treatment and side effects, but mm-hmm. you might have this kind of high anxiety. So right. we want to see, yeah, yes. So we want to see um, if exercise is helping with their anxiety too. Mm-hmm. And maybe lastly, you know, exercise is um, kind of, we call it re- prehabilitation. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, also if you are getting any surgery and then you fear pre-training yourself before any treatment and then you can have a better outcome from this treatment or mm-hmm. your fitness level is better or mm-hmm. your, for example, lung cancer patients, you need to improve your lung capacity to get the lung cancer treatment and mm-hmm. you have better result. Right. So if you have, if you do exercise before any impending treatments in these patients with a prostate cancer, and if they improve their fitness, they might have a better treatment outcome in the future if they, mm-hmm. they get treatment. So those right. are the three important yeah, components of the study. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think you introduced three really some um, important terms. So there, are, there, there is active surveillance, Mm-hmm. Um, and also there is a prehabilitation. Right. Um, and I have a question, follow up question about active surveillance. So compared to passive surveillance. Mm-hmm. So when you say active surveillance, what does that entail exactly? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So this is not for all cancer, but this is very specific to prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. So once you are done with the pro- or any cancer treatment, you are just following up uh, every year, mm-hmm. for example, in, in, gen- in general. Mm-hmm. But for a- uh, active surveillance, these prostate cancer patients who have their tumors, they are at least um, seeing their doctor every three months or six months to do blood work. And also every one year, there's a specific protocols for each like centers and every one year they get um, like a, a, um, imaging scanning mm-hmm. or biopsies every one and a half a year. Mm-hmm. So there's this very specific protocol they follow to actively mm-hmm. monitor their tumor. Right. So any, so this blood work is more like regular and more short-term follow-up if it triggers any uh, concern that mm-hmm. uh, tumor looks like it's growing, they have to be really um, um, concerned and then they do more um, monitoring mm-hmm. uh, things. So, so I guess your work was to essentially to, to incorporate um, exercise programs into active surveillance for pros- prostate cancer patients. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, and in pre- previously, you also mentioned about baseline characteristics of your potential samples. So right. when you say baseline characteristics, what do you mean by that? So baseline characteristics are basically uh, 
the any type of demographic or medical or behavior uh, characteristics or profiles that um, that are um, based on the patients who are recruited before their intervention. Mm -hmm. So that's so, yes. Yeah. So so in RCTs, like mm -hmm. other experiments, um, there's pre kind of a pre-intervention measures and right. post-intervention measures. That's right. That's exactly the yeah. right. From here, so they are we, we are recruiting, let's say, pa ten patients, and we measure mm -hmm. every everyone, and we randomize these ten patients either exercise group or control group, mm -hmm. and we measure the same thing after the treatment. I see. And they compare the two, but mm -hmm. these like characteristics I, I mentioned. Right, and in the treatment phase, uh, people will be randomized into. Uh, control group or intervention group. Exactly. Right, right. Okay, um, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, and in your article, so in the folio article, um, you mentioned that, and you also said it uh, just now, exercise can potentially help reduce the fear and anxiety pa uh, patients may have from living with cancer. Um, so, so, I guess there's a there's this focus on uh, mental health and improving mental health among cancer patients um, who are in active surveillance and and so from your study like how many people in the intervention group and how many people in the control group uh, showed progression to anxiety oh, yeah. Sure. So regarding anxiety, mm -hmm. so we have 26 patients in each group, exercise group, and the other control group. Mm -hmm. the exercise, so we, I don't have a specific numbers of patients because we just look at the mean value of mm -hmm. patients who are uh, the, the mean value of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And we compared, so for example, at baseline, exercise group had a specific number of anxiety and control group as well after the mm -hmm. interview. And we measured the two and we mm -hmm. see the difference of these numbers. So exercise group in, uh, actually decreased their anxiety levels and control mm -hmm. group was all, almost like the same mm. level between the baseline and the post-intervention mm -hmm. and the difference of the exercise group uh, was uh, the anxiety level in the exercise group was significantly different from the control group right. in our study. So this was also very important or very exciting finding of the ways mm -hmm. that uh, exercise can help with uh, anxiety patients. Right, right. So the results showing that exercise group actually shows um, lowered or decreased anxiety and the mm -hmm. control group who did not participate in exercise programming um, showing the same amount of, yeah, no changes in, in anxiety that actually says something about the importance of exercise program uh, right. in, in this uh, active surveillance phase. Exactly, nice. exactly. And this anxiety, mm -hmm. Also, just a little bit more about this. And this anxiety was very, very prostate cancer specific. Mm. So we measured different types of anxiety. So we also measured like general anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like, are you anxious? Are you distressed? Are you mm -hmm. feeling um, depressed? So mm -hmm. Also, we have another part of this questionnaire they're asking: Are you concerned about your prostate cancer progressing mm -hmm. in the? So it was very much like prostate cancer specific, but their mm -hmm. overall anxiety was not different between the two groups, but prostate cancer wise, mm -hmm. it was different. Right, okay. Um, and in terms of tumor growth, so you measured that pre and post as well? Yes, in a sense, yeah, we measured biochemical progression mm -hmm. of prostate cancer mm -hmm. and then which called the PSA, prostate uh, specific antigen. It's a very 
uh, specific specific uh, biomarker that are uh, indicating any progression of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Exercise group, the, the, this number, the higher, the worse. There's mm -hmm. the number goes up mm -hmm. and uh, patients or the doctors are concerned that uh, exercise, uh, cancer might have been progressed. Mm -hmm. Exercise actually in, in this setting uh, decreased the PSA level in um, compared to the control group. Mm -hmm. Control group was, um, they didn't also have an increase in PSA level, but exercise group had a decrease mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, in, uh, in their PSA level. Uh -huh. So that's also another very exciting finding about uh, this very, ERASE trial. Exactly, I was very excited about this. <laughs> yeah. Finding exercise can help with actual cancer uh, progression as a marker. Mm -hmm. Although we are not measuring the actual tumor size or we didn't do a uh, biopsy, so we don't know any pro uh, pro aggressiveness of tumor, but we just, we were able to see this biochemical progression. Of, mm -hmm. of nice. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um... Okay, well, thanks for the interview today and talking about your research. It was very um, uh, insightful and and um, I'm sure in addition to the lecture video recording that I'm going to post, I'm sure this will be a good addition in terms of, you know, for students to understand, understand uh, randomized controlled trial, uh, what the actual RCT look like. Um, so thanks again, Dr. Kang. Um, is there anything else you would like to convey to students at the end? It could be anything you're just, you know, embarking on your new career um, in the States. Uh, so is there anything that you want to convey to our students who want to, would likely end up getting a job in health professions? I think... I, as a also, also I was, I used to be a third year bachelor student before, did not know what to do, but um, uh, I, I found it really, really rewarding to me. Um, I get to see these patients every day, pretty much mm -hmm. every day before COVID, but um, this is really rewarding. And I felt really uh, fulfilled that I can, actually offer something very significant to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, I just want to say that you can look around. There are some really good uh, things you, as an exercise uh, major people, you can um, provide something very um, meaningful to um, maybe can be anyone who, who, who are with disease mm -hmm. or, or, or marginalized who are, um, um, or uh, people with disabilities. And there are so many places we can help people. So mm -hmm. if you can look around and there are some ideas you might uh, want to help people. And um, again, I think if you have any questions about uh, anything about this exercise oncology or career, um, you can email me. I guess Young can uh, share my email to you. Sure, mm -hmm. I'll do that. And just uh, feel free to uh, contact me. Okay. Well, thanks, Dr. Kang. Thank you so much, Young, for having me here. I was, I was so happy to be <laughs> an uh, interviewee here. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.